Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm Greg Eastwood. I'm the director of the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this special symposium, Taking Responsibility for Ethical Leadership in a Complex World. The Inamori Center was started several years ago through a very generous uh, gift from Kazuo Inamori. Dr. Inamori founded the Kyocera Corporation when he was 27, almost 50 years ago. And from the very beginning of his life, it, it is evident from his writings and just talking with him, he's been concerned about ethics among leaders, uh, not only in business, but around the world. And of course, the events and the disclosures of the last, let's say, decade or so has only made that concern that Dr. Inamori has even greater. The purpose of the Inamori Center, then, is to foster ethical leadership around the world. That's a very simple statement. I think it's 14 words. I don't have to look at my paper when I, when I say that. It's a very simple, straightforward purpose to foster ethical leadership around the world. But where does the world begin? It begins right in this room, on this campus, and the Inamori Center is also concerned about ethical leadership and the development of such on this campus. And for that matter, uh, all that we touch. So uh, this is a relevant subject, of course, and uh, it's particularly relevant today because this is a very special day for the university and for Barbara Snyder. She is our leader of this great university. So it's my pleasure to ask Barbara Snyder to come to the lectern and say a few words. Barbara. Thanks, Greg. It's wonderful to see so many people here for what I know is going to be a very important discussion. We all are confronted with ethical issues every day. And as leaders in an increasingly complex and global society, our actions demonstrate our ethical values. It is, of course, our responsibility to lead with integrity. This symposium ought to be required for every university president at the beginning of her tenure, and I'm thrilled that it's a part of the beginning of my tenure here at Case Western Reserve University. Here at the university, we explore ethical issues from a global perspective, nurture international awareness and understanding of our common humanity through all areas of study and teaching and, of course, the practice of ethics. And with the help of the Inamori Center and the leadership of Dr. Greg Eastwood, we will continue to pursue excellence in this area. Our students are the leaders of the future, and we must help prepare them to make sound ethical decisions regardless of their chosen careers. At this university, we accept that responsibility, the one that comes with being a leader both in the community and globally. So I look forward to a great discussion. Thank you all panelists for being with us today. Thank you. I'd like to also recognize uh, the Snyder family sitting in the front row, uh, Michael and uh, the Snyder's three children. And of course, I could uh, <clears throat> recognize every distinguished person in the room, but if you cut it at board chair and university president, I'd like to <laughs> recognize our own board chair, Franklin Salata. <laughs> and the recent uh, president of Ohio State University, uh, Karen Holbrook. We have many uh, deans and vice presidents and other people in the audience uh, and former and current trustees, but I won't take the time at this moment to individually recognize them. I want to thank you for coming. I realize your uh, motivation for coming might be several. One would be uh, the topic, if you're interested in the topic. Uh, also, we have a stellar panel and maybe you're also wondering what you would do between 1 o'clock and 4.30, and this is a good thing to do. So whatever your motivation is, I'm happy that you're here. 
Uh, I'd like to introduce the uh, panelists, and let me tell you before I do that, the way we're going to work this is that after the introductions of the panelists, uh, I will then <coughs> turn to uh, Congresswoman uh, Stephanie Tubbs-Jones and ask her a question. And that's the way it will work. We will not have any... <laughs> it's a little bit contrived, though, because she might have some idea of what this question is. But uh, in any event, so we will play off of questions. There will be no set pieces that the panelists uh, uh, say. And then I want you to be thinking of questions that you want to ask the panelists, because we'll get to that in due course. And uh, not only questions that you might want to ask, but comments. We want you to contribute to this. Uh, I'll be taking at least mental notes and maybe some other notes, and uh, I'm going to be writing Dr. Inamori a letter tomorrow. I want to put what you say in that letter. So the Honorable Stephanie Tubbs-Jones is a member of the U.S. House of Representatives representing Ohio's 11th District. She's serving her fifth term and is the first African-American woman elected from Ohio to the House. Uh, her current committee assignments include the Powerful Ways and Means Committee, as, and she serves as chair of the Committee on Standards of Official Conduct. I think that's Congress ease for ethics. She, she is a strong legislative and policy advocate for education, access to health care for minority and underrepresented groups, and for the elderly and veterans. Congresswoman Jones is a longtime civic and community volunteer and leader, and she has two degrees from this university, her baccalaureate and her law degrees, and we're proud that she's one of our alumna, alumni. That's AE, by the way. <laughs> Next is uh, Patricia Marshall, sitting closest to me. She's professor of bioethics and anthropology in the Department of Bioethics at our School of Medicine. She ser currently serves uh, or receives NIH funding to study informed consent to genetic epidemiologic research in the United States and in Nigeria. She's a member of the investigative team in Nigeria and Kenya. And Kenya. She's served on the executive boards of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities and several other national organizations. In 1999, Dr. Marshall was a consultant to the president's, that's the president of the United States, not this one, uh, National Bioethics Advisory or, uh, Commission. In 2000, she was a consultant to the World Health Organization. In 2001, she's appointed to the National Academy of Sciences Study Panel on IRBs. Those are the committees that um, approve or disapprove human research. And recently, she was appointed to the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Human Research Protection, the Office of Human Research Protection at the National Institute of Health. Uh, Professor Scharf, next, uh, second to my right, is Professor of Law and Director of the Frederick Cox International Law Center here at our law school. During the first Bush and Clinton administrations, and I'm not sure if that's the first Clinton administration or just the Clinton administration, <laughs> in any event, <coughs> Professor Scharf served in the office of the legal advisor of the U.S. Department of State, where he held the positions of counsel to the Counterterrorism Bureau, attorney advisor for United Nations Affairs, and delegate to the U.N. General Assembly and the U.N. Human Rights Commission. Professor Scharf was the School of Law's Alumni Association Distinguished uh, Teacher two years ago. He is the author of over 60 articles and 10 books, including Balkan Justice, which was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize in 1998, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which was awarded the American Society of International Law's Book of the Year Award in 99, and Peace with Justice, which won the International Association of Penal Law Book of the Year uh, three years, four years ago. He has testified before the U.S. Foreign Senate Relations Committee and has stories to prove it, which he told at lunch. Uh, Armed Services Committee, he's appeared on many TV programs, including ABC World News Tonight, uh, Nightline, Jim Lehrer, NBC, CNN, National Public Radio. And in February 2005, Professor Scharf and the Public International Law and Policy Group that he co-founded, uh, they were jointly nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by six governments and the prosecutor of an international uh, criminal tribunal for the work they've done in prosecuting people like Saddam Hussein, Charles Taylor, and Sloban Milosevic. And then Gary Winnick, and far in there, is the uh, faculty director of the Institute of Management and Engineering, which we call TIME, that's the acronym, and chair of the Department of Macromolecular Science here in our own engineering school. Earlier in his career, he was at MIT, 
and uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and was the founding chair of the Chemical Engineering Department at Virginia Commonwealth. He came here to uh, Case Western Reserve in 2004 as professor of chemical engineering uh, and co-director of time at that time. He's published lots of papers, uh, co-edited several books, and he holds 18 U.S. patents. And this is uh, sort of the non-academic or maybe the synthesis of uh, business and academia that uh, we'll find in Professor Winnick. Uh, he received the 2007 John Hyatt Award uh, for his benefit to society from the Society of Plastic Engineers. So let's proceed. Um, I already told you what the rules are, and uh, keep, the major thing to keep in mind is pay, pay attention and think of things that you'd like to ask the, uh, the panelists. So, Congresswoman Tubbs Jones. During the past few years, there have been revelations about corporate, nonprofit, religious, and government officials entrusted with leadership who have misused their positions and offices for personal, family, or others' benefit or gain. These actions have led to a public mistrust and skepticism of societal institutions important to advancing society. As an elected official, official what traits and behaviors do you view as critical to ethical leadership and restoring public trust in government. First of all, let me say thank you very much to President Snyder for the opportunity to participate in the panel. Uh, thank you to our interim president, Eastwood, for all the work that he's done. I have to say that this is like being in law school on the first day <laughs> and being the first person called on by the professor to answer a question. Fortunately, at that point, I knew the answer to that question, but uh, this one may be a little more difficult. I, I, some t I tell people that I think ethics is common sense and real life moral judgment. And it came true to me about that when I was the Cuyahoga County prosecutor and I was hiring young lawyers to be my assistant. And initially, I'd never asked the question, what is your job? What do you think your job is as a prosecutor? So I ended up with some assistants who wanted to win at all cost. So as I began to do my interviews, I started to ask the question, do you understand what your job is? It's not a win-loss record. It's to do justice. And it doesn't mean you're always going to win. If you talk to great lawyers, they will tell you if you haven't lost a case, you haven't tried enough of them. So I think that it's good judgment. I think it's moral experience. I think it's the experience of doing. See, what, what is unethical for elected officials today was part of the core 20, 30, 40 years ago. It was an expectation. And unfortunately, some of my colleagues Forgot, it's 40 years later. And they're still doing it the way they used to do it. So I think, it, and I think it begins with school. I think it begins with experiences. I, it would be really nice if we had more time for, I'm blessed to have a relationship with my predecessor, Lewis Stokes. And so I can talk to him. He was chair of ethics. I tell him, if you give me one more assignment like you had, but, um, <laughs> to have that conversation and we need to spend more time in, in, in the practice of being in public life and in the practice of being in medicine, the practice of law, the practice of being in leadership and understand you gotta, it's more than being successful. That's important in our life. I'll be short, Mr. President, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, we'll get back. Uh, Professor Scharf, uh, you served in the government for a while, and as a former government lawyer, can you give us an example of, from your experience of a difficult ethics issue that confronted you and your colleagues at the State Department? Yeah, I think um, anybody who serves in the administration, uh, the executive branch, is frequently faced with very difficult ethical challenges, and especially if you're a government lawyer. 
Um, I, I remember in political science at Duke University, I took a course called Political Choice and Value Conflict, which looked at these issues, but it couldn't possibly have prepared me for the real world. It was more like um, the kinds of discussions were sort of like a hothouse flower, and then you take it out in the real world, and it quickly <laughs> is tested, um, especially with the climate in, in D.C. Well. What really comes to mind in my experience was I had been at the State Department for three years. I was about 29 years old, so I was a young government lawyer, and genocide reared its ugly head for the first time in 60 years in Europe, and it occurred in Bosnia, and it was a place that the President and the Secretary of State and other high-level people clearly did not want us getting involved in. They thought that it would quickly become like the Vietnam War and it would sidetrack their goal for health care reform, education, and other things that would have been the modern equivalent of Johnson's Great Society. So Warren Christopher insisted that what was going on in Bosnia was an ethnic feud and it was different from the Holocaust. He testified before the Congress. And we knew at the time from cables that we were getting and reports from the CIA, which have now been unclassified, that that wasn't the case, that it was completely one-sided. 90% of the violence was systematic and it was Serbian killing Muslims in Bosnia. And it was clearly meeting the definition of genocide. So we wanted to have the government say that what was going on there was genocide because that would have created the moral imperative for the world and for our country to do something to stop it. And at the time, 100,000 people had perished. Over the next several years, the United States government refused to acknowledge it was genocide. And they put a gag order on the lower level people who were claiming that it was. Uh, when we drafted press guidance that said in answer to the question, is a genocide, we wanted the, him to say, Warren Christopher to say, yes, it was, uh, that would not be cleared from his office. We sent a dissent channel memorandum to him, which is a way you can try to get the Secretary of State's attention, and he rejected it. And then finally, a number of my colleagues ended up resigning, and it was the first mass resignation from the State Department since the Vietnam era, and they posted their resignation letters on the front pages of the Washington Post and New York Times, and only then did the U.S. government acknowledge that genocide had occurred in Bosnia, and in the meantime, 150,000 people died. So these are the kinds of things that occur on a regular basis, and we'll talk about more of those that have happened more recently, but this was the one that I was involved in most closely. And one of the difficult issues for me is, as a government lawyer, do I resign over this, or do I work on the inside to try to get the government to change its opinion? And in this case, we weren't committing the atrocities, but by obs obscuring them and lying about them, we were preventing the world from taking action to, pre to stop them. And these kinds of ethical issues, I think, are, are the, the most difficult issues that face the government, and that was one I was involved in. Dr. Marshall, you're, I forgot to mention, I think, in my introduction that she is a sociologist uh, before she got her doctorate, and uh, you've been involved in, the bio, in bioethics for over 20 years. So what do you believe are the key po components of ethical leadership? First of all, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's, my, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with all of you. And welcome to you, President Snyder. We're very glad that you are here. I believe that the key components of ethical leadership are, first of all, integrity, responsibility, and of course, accountability, and humility. I think that um, ethical leadership involves necessarily relationships, a relationship between individuals in a social group. Trust is foundational. I don't think that you can be an ethical leader without being, without being grounded in trust with the people who you represent, I think that, that it's important to have moral imagination so that you can be creative in the considered judgment that you use in making decisions or working with others 
in resolving conflicts. To be a leader necessarily implies that there are followers. If you are an ethical leader and you act on trust and you keep opportunities open for dialogue, then it's empowering for both you as a leader and also for the people, the individuals and the communities that you represent. Patty, I'm gonna stick with you for the second question because you've given us sort of a contextual framework at least of how you think about ethical leadership, but you've spent a lot of time on the ground, so to speak, in Africa, other places. Can you give us an example of an ethical issue that you confronted when you were conducting genetic research? Yes, I can. I was um, a member of the investigative team uh, for the International HapMap Project, specifically for the African sites, three African sites. Um, the uh, International HapMap Project, the focus of this initiative is to, was to develop a haplotype map for the human genome. Um, DNA samples have been and continue to be collected from populations throughout the world. I helped design and implement the work that we did um, with the uh, Aluya community in Kenya, a Maasai community in Kenya, and also um, a Yoruba population in the community of Aba Alamu in Nigeria. There were funds that were added to the grant that we had. This is an NIH grant. Um, there were funds included to, uh, th that were designated as community benefits. That's a good way to put it, community benefits. When we met with the um, local traditional tribal council in the, this community of Ala, Ala, Ab, Aba Alamu, um, and for those, this is in the city of Ibadan, so we're, it, this is a metropolitan area, but it happens that there's a, um, a traditional and well-functioning um, council, tribal council. When we met with them uh, to talk about the project, they requested additional benefits. They said, in fact, that they wanted a hospital. And so, um, of course, how many researchers have um, the funds in their NIH grants for a hospital? <laughs> no one that I know. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sitting with a group and I'm thinking, okay, I'm in a market now. We're gonna start high and then go low and then somehow meet in the middle. But this was a very serious issue. Um, and we pursued it. And, uh, it call, and it was resolved. In fact, they were given additional funding. But it was resolved over time, and it calls attention to the importance, again, of trust and responsibility and shared responsibility. As researchers, we had obligations to this community to represent their rights, to represent them, in interactions with NIH. We also, as researchers, had to be concerned about what was gonna happen to f our relationship with NIH in the future. And so it was a complicated process, the resolution of, of uh, community benefits um, for the Yoruba population involved in the HapMap project, and it has implications for um, what will happen in the future when uh, uh, you're doing any kind of biomedical or behavioral research that's funded by NIH in a low-income setting. Did they get their hospital? No, they did not. <laughs> but we did work with the um, the community advisory board that we had helped establish. Um, and the final resolution involved the, the establishment actually of a trust, 
a trust fund. And I think that in the future, um, there will be some challenges about how these funds are used because, of course, the issue of representation um, can be problematic. In other words, um, whose, whose interests are finally going to be represented when those funds are allocated? How will those, um, how will that money be used? Um, and it raises a number of questions. What are our obligations ethically as researchers to uh, sustain this discussion into the future? How long will these funds be available and so on? Thank you. Gary Winnick, you're both a professor and an entrepreneur. Can you give us any examples of a difficult ethical issue that you've confronted as a entrepreneurial professor? Sure. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks. Excuse me. Thanks, Dr. Eastwood, and uh, welcome. And congratulations again to Dr. Snyder uh, as president and her family, and welcome to all of you. Uh, I'll uh, address that question, Greg, in the following way: uh, We faculty at very, very good universities, such as this one, have a desire to make an impact, and that can be uh, accomplished in many ways from. Uh, a classroom setting where we, we impart knowledge and confidence and, and, and ultimate success into our graduates to fundamental discoveries that may not have any immediate application but people build on from there and, and exciting things happen to uh, things we develop, we discover that may have applications and, and may have commercial potential. The latter gets uh, a bit complicated at times because it involves stakeholders outside the confines of the university. We have uh, uh, industrial partners who fund research. We have uh, perhaps uh, entrepreneurs who are looking to get something started that relies on a uh, piece of technology in one's laboratory. And uh, it, it turns out there are, there are mechanisms to deal with that. And, and the ethical issue sometimes is the temptation not so much to be, to be sneaky or skirt the system, but to, uh, to try to fly under the radar at times because, you know, at early stage laboratory discoveries sometimes are so high risk and, and uh, the potential is so uncertain that there's a temptation to believe that this may not go very far anyway, so let's, let's see what we can do as opposed to having detailed agreements in place. But again, the complication is there are these other stakeholders and the event of, in the event of success, which is the ultimate hope, uh, things can get a bit thorny. So uh, uh, that is an issue that I've seen several times and the way personally I've dealt with it is to, uh, at whatever, I've been at four universities now and uh, each one has its own process, uh, typically very similar about how to approach this kind of situation. The technology transfer office has a process and it's, it's more than just simply checks and balances. It's not just a watchdog. Uh, uh, phenomenon, but it's as uh, Congresswoman Tubbs Jones would say, uh, uh, it, it helps us uh, ensure our common sense in the way we approach these kinds of things. And uh, to remind ourselves that we, this is an educational institution, we have to protect ourselves, our students, and everyone else involved. And so there, uh, I'll just conclude by saying there is a process, it works, it's a very friendly environment, and it's very proactive towards uh, taking technology out of the laboratory. Before I go on to ask Professor Scharf another question, does any of the panelists have a question or comment in mind that has been generated by anything you've heard so far? <laughs> well, keep, keep thinking. And uh, Michael, uh, recently two former law professors from Berkeley and Harvard, we've heard of those places, who worked in the Department of Justice their names are John Yu and Jack Goldsmith, co-authored what has become known as the White House Torture Memos. I understand that the law school's Cox International Center, which you direct, recently hosted a conference on this issue. In your opinion, did these co-authors violate the professional code of ethics or even international law? I think they did on both counts, although it's a gray enough area that they've gotten away with it. And um, other than being indicted by some foreign countries and maybe foreclosing some of their travel, their careers haven't really been negatively affected. But let me tell you a little bit about this and, and what the ethical conflict is. Um, in 2002, 
when the United States was really railing from 9-11 and felt that the best way to deal with it was to round up a lot of people and interrogate them down in Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib and other black sites around the world, there was concern that the interrogators might fall afoul of our own internal domestic legislation that said that anybody who committed an act of torture could be prosecuted in the United States. So these lawyers who had been law professors and were on loan to the Office of Legal Counsel, which is the elite bureau of the Department of Justice, were asked to write a memo, which was really an advocacy piece, that would indicate that these people could get away with torture. And their memo basically said three things. First of all, that the Geneva Conventions were not applicable during the War on Terror. Secondly, that the Torture Convention only applied to the most extreme and life-threatening methods and not waterboarding, which was the method of choice. And thirdly, that the US domestic law prohibiting torture didn't apply to interrogations abroad, especially at Guantanamo Bay. These memos were not balanced. They failed to give an accurate and complete picture of the law. They weren't objective. Rather, they were products of aggressive lawyering written to provide protection for anybody who was doing these interrogations. And as a result, they actually, I believe, led to a permissive climate which created the situation in which the abuses at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay could flourish. The issue raises the debate over what is the appropriate ethical role of a government lawyer. And there are 40,000 government lawyers throughout Congress, the federal agencies, and the various departments, going all the way up to the Attorney General, and we have a new one to, um, very soon. The question is, <laughs> I agree. The question is, are these government lawyers supposed to apply an agency approach, which is a, a client-centered approach to lawyering? Are they like ordinary lawyers with a duty of loyalty, zeal, and confidentiality? This is a model of lawyer as advocate. Or as government lawyers, do they have a different approach that's necessary, a public interest approach, which would place greater weight on fairness and justice? The client would be seen as not simply the Justice Department, the President, or the administration, but rather the nation at large and the laws that govern us all. And here, the model would be the lawyer as conscience, the lawyer as internal referee. Now, this debate is still ongoing. And the problem, I think, in this particular case is that the government ap applied that agency approach and didn't think about the other approach and, and its relevance. And I think that within the government, all government lawyers need to recognize that the other approach is also important. Ultimately, an attorney who gives advice intended to assist or provide a roadmap in violating or circumventing the law can be held complicit in their client's criminal conduct. And that is why several countries have actually indicted these two attorneys for the legal advice that they gave. The other approach, I think, is the one that we remember from the Watergate era, when the evening of the Saturday night massacre, the top Department of Justice officials who were asked to fire the special prosecutor all resigned, one after another. And those people, I think, are the heroes of the concept of an ethical government lawyer. And then there was the one lawyer who did not resign and did fire the person, and his name we all remember as uh, former Judge Bork. I'll leave it at that. Uh, Congresswoman Tubbs Jones, uh, it has been said, and these sequence of these questions actually do relate, uh, it has been said that elected and appointed officials should be held to a higher standard of moral and ethical conduct than the general public. It actually begs the question, what is the standard of ethical conduct? Well, what is your view on this? Did I give you that question? <laughs> Adrian Ziak, where are you? You planted that oh, question no. somewhere. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, if you would allow me just for a moment, uh, having been a government lawyer all of my political uh, and legal career, I don't think that there's a double standard, that there is some agency representation 
and some client representation. Your client is the public. And so it is your job to represent the interests of your public. Now clearly, when I was the prosecutor, I was counsel for the public libraries, the sheriff, the police, uh, all the judges and all that. And at the point that most of the time that I came in, they had engaged in conduct. So I was trying to instruct them on whether their conduct would take them this way or it would take them in, a, in another direction. I, I, I think that sometimes that's part of the dilemma. I viewed my staff at the prosecutor's office as the largest public law firm in the state of Ohio. We were just as good as all the private practitioners. We just didn't make the same money. Uh, but we also had a standard that we had to meet. Now back to whether elected officials should be treated more harshly for their conduct. I've been blessed uh, to have a family and staff who says, oh, so you're a congressperson, so what? <laughs> that helps me to keep my feet planted on the ground such that I don't think necessarily that I have any greater um, sway than uh, or importance than everyday people. Unfortunately, that's not what has happened to most of my colleagues. You know, they blow us up, and you have the people who run behind you. Yes, Congressman, and all the yes people. The dilemma is that unfortunately, the public looks upon elected officials as being more, as my son would say, they ain't all that. And so what then happens is when an elected official or public official engages in conduct that someone else might engage in and it would not be such a big deal, it's, it's out, it, I think to the extent that it is it's somewhat blown out of proportion. When I first became the prosecutor, the plain dealer used to write me up and say, well, she just won't go after public officials. I said, plain dealer, when you get to be prosecutor, you go after them. But the reality is that when you prosecute a public official, you have to have all your I's dotted, all your T's crossed, and you have to have a good prosecution. Otherwise, you ain't going nowhere. So when I started prosecuting public officials, then the plain dealer thought I was this great prosecutor, at least for a minute they did anyway. Uh, and, so, and, and so my thought is that our conduct should be subject to scrutiny but that not necessarily, depending on the facts and circumstances, should the penalty be greater. And that's why I hate mandatory sentencing, because judges should have the discretion to impose the appropriate sentence based on the facts and circumstances. That was a long answer, and I apologize. Did we excite some uh, <coughs> questions among the panelists here? <laughs> Professor Winnick. Entrepreneurs are assumed to be risk takers. In your experience, are there conflicts between taking risk and ethical behavior? Greg, there, there are always uh, conflicts, but uh, um, ethical behavior is a challenge to one's integrity and uh, it, it should be responded uh, to accordingly. And perhaps we'll have uh, more to say about this later, but back to the question about entrepreneurs and risks. Let me first uh, just say something about risk. We've all known serial entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs who start and run companies for a living, and we frequently think they're crazy. They uh, max out credit cards. They take second mortgages on houses. Uh, but, you know, there's another element to, to that risk of an entrepreneur. Studies have shown that for, for generations, one of the risks entrepreneurs face and deal with is the risk to not do it. This, this is what really made the country great. This country great, I believe, is, uh, you know, it's, said, it's called the land of opportunity. Why? Because one can come with few... Uh, coins in your pocket and not knowing much of the language, uh, immigrants built uh, much of this country and, and saw it as an oppor opportunity. So, so just to finish that thought, 
one of the risks entrepreneurs face is, again, the risk of not taking advantage, seizing the moment. Uh, also for generations, entrepreneurs have used networks, especially immigrants. They would come to the country, people who, had c who came just before them, knew a little language, saved a little money, had an extra room in the house, were part of the support structure. Now, the thing about networks is they're, they're uh, dynamic and they're fragile, and impropriety and unethical behavior gets noticed in networks much more than one-on-one -on -one kinds of interactions. Uh, so I would argue that uh, entrepreneurs, it's always been a healthy thing to act ethically, but today, with the internet and email and blogs, uh, I would say one of the biggest risks to entrepreneurs is to not act ethically because your actions of impropriety can be magnified, amplified uh, for the world to see. And, uh, you know, networks are more important today than ever. There's an interesting book uh, called Wikinomics, uh, a takeoff on, uh, on Wikipedia. I forget the authors, but it talks about mass collaboration, uh, being able to connect with the best ideas around the world. And, and because of all that, again, it's, it's just absolutely critical to act properly because you will, uh, you will be uh, tattooed with, uh, uh, with a very negative uh, 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 description uh, if you're not careful. So it's, it's extremely important, especially today. Get into some very uh, Aristotelian, or uh, yeah, anyway, Aristotle said it, <laughs> uh, about the relationship of virtue and behavior. What you Yes. I respond to sure. something that he said. I, I, I can only think back uh, when I was on financial services and we were dealing with global crossing and Enron and all of these situations where uh, the leadership in, in, in private uh, companies, they went crazy. They knew their conduct was inappropriate, but they, they went after it anyway. And I had this young uh, president of one of these companies and I said to him, I said, well, how are you doing this afternoon, sir? And he says, oh, I'm doing fine. I said, um, how long have you been working for this company? And he said, so and so on. And I said, well, how old are you? He says, I'm 40. I said, 40 years old? I said, how much money do you make? He says, it's a matter of public record. I said, no kidding, but this is a congressional hearing and I'm a member of Congress. I'd like to have an answer. <laughs> then he says, well, you don't know how important I am. You don't understand how many decisions I make, how much risk I take, and on and on and on and on. And I said, well, then how much money do you make? <laughs> he was so blown up by the people in the company. And I, I'm sure he was, must have been smart to be making that kind of money at 40 years old, but somehow we've not in, in the process, and I don't, uh, this is a capitalistic country, and I don't want to, anybody to think I don't want businesses to make money. I want them to make money because my constituents have a job, and they can have it in and make money. But there's got to be some connection, some connection somewhere. How much, what can you do with $70 million a year? I mean, what, help out all the rest of us, maybe. But I think that it presents a real problem ethically within business in those situations. And then what happens is it presents a problem to the legislature because then people want us to fix it. They want us to fix uh, the whole situation with uh, the, the hedge funds and whether it's personal or capital gain, they want us to fix global or uh, Enron and uh, they want us to fix Arthur Anderson and we ought to be fixing it before you come to me to make the law to change the conduct. Congresswoman Subjunk mentioned the Global Crossing. That was led by a guy named Gary Winnick, W-I-N-N-I-C-K. <laughs> okay, I knew uh, you from somewhere. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a more pronounceable version of my name, but a, a colleague back in 2001 uh, saw me and said, you know, I heard about you on NPR this morning and it wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> Before I ask uh, Professor Marshall a last question, and then we'll turn it over to you, 
Um, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, I talked about Dr. Inamori. He was on this campus in 1995 to give the T. Keith Glennon lecture. And he talked about leadership, ethical leadership, and his own journey through life. At that time, he was about 62 or 63 years old, Dr. Inamori. And he founded this very successful company when he was age 27. And he talked just what you said, Congresswoman, about very successful people in business becoming arrogant and basically shut off. And it was happening to him, to Dr. Namori. And he somehow caught hold of himself and turned it around. Dr. Marshall, what can the university do to support ethical leadership among university faculty, <laughs> staff, and students? Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that right now there are some programs that are in place and ongoing. I think that if you imagine what a leader is, what is a leader? A leader is someone who has commanding authority and influence. What is ethics? Ethics is about a system, a moral system of principles and values that we believe to be important and that we apply to conduct, to our behavior, to others' behavior and our own. I think that um, as a university, what we need to do is to take advantage of opportunities and to create opportunities to promote leadership in every sphere in classroom situations, I don't think that in, um, in at, at broader levels across the university, um, with uh, not just with our students, but with faculty and staff, I think that we need to think creatively about how to create a moral space, and I'm using that language, that terminology very purposefully, a moral space where we can talk about what it means to be, to act ethically, to act morally, and to resolve the uh, kinds of um, uh, challenges that come up when there are very strong differences of opinions about what it means to act ethically. But I think that across the board, we need to encourage role models. We need to allow people opportunities to practice at ethical leadership. In some, um, I'm thinking of the SAGES program that we have, for example. It would be very easy to incorporate attention to ethical leadership um, using uh, within that curriculum. I think in the medical school, um, we can do that in so many different ways during clinical rotations at the beginning of uh, their, the student's training when they are learning how to be a physician and really looking for um, mentors um, and uh, who, who can help them become um, really not just good physicians in the technical sense, but um, good physicians in the moral sense. Can I answer that? Certainly. Um, at the law school, I've taught a variety of courses from criminal law, criminal procedure, international law, and, and I know um, the president has also started out her career teaching in the criminal law area at our law school, and so you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's not a day that goes by in class where there's not a case or a teaching moment involving ethics. And there's a professor from Stanford, uh, Debbie, Deborah Rohde, who wrote a book called The Pervasive Teaching Style of Ethics, something to that effect. And the idea was that she would give modules for every law school course, and it'd be a paperback, and that the professors would look through it, and when those issues came up, they could draw on it, and even if they weren't experts at ethics, in every class, in every 
course throughout the curriculum, they could raise those issues. And I think probably the time is right for someone to do that on a macro level, um, if, if not you know, someone with a book, but maybe the institution of the university, so that throughout the university, all of the professors <laughs> know when to recognize a teachable moment involving ethics. And those moments shouldn't be once a semester, but once a class. I That's agree. good. I good. Agree. This gets to uh, something I've been thinking about and talking with people about, and that is not only how do we teach ethics in ethics classes in the curriculum, but how do we integrate ethical teaching and behavior throughout everything? Just as uh, two previous speakers have said or implied, how can you make the teaching of mathematics an ethical experience or other science courses or drama or history. You know, some, some courses sort of intuitively lead themselves more to the teaching of ethics, but why not integrate ethics into mathematics, advanced calculus or something? Might be a relief. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Lynn. <laughs> My wife is a mathematician. Um, just like many of the programs that Professor Scharf on television has participated in. We have our people in the audience here to carry microphones to you. Bridget Hall, Bridget, would you identify yourself? There you are down here. And Laurel Chenez over here are ready to take your comments or questions and you may direct them. If it's a comment, just say it. If you have a question, you can direct it to one or more of the panelists or to the whole panel. Looks like we have some people here. You, you go ahead and choose. Uh, and we'll alternate the uh, microphones. And identify yourself, please, Ted. Um, lately, uh, since 9-11 since particularly. That, his name is Ted, oh, a trustee. <laughs> um, lately, since 9-11, we've heard a lot of um, discussion about what, what is the greater, the greater good versus personal rights. Um, and, and Professor Sharp, you actually talked about this a little bit when you were talking about torture. Um, there is, there, there's a problem, I think, an ethical problem of trying to decide whether or not society is more important than each individual within the society. And how do you weigh, uh, how do you ethically weigh the importance of each one of those individuals? Uh, some of the other things that have happened have been the, uh, the recent laws that allow, uh, um, wiretapping without appropriate, uh, in my opinion, appropriate uh, 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 chain of command. Uh, so you can just basically go in and wiretap people. You take away their privacy completely. But maybe you're saving somebody from getting blown up in a car bomb uh, by doing so. And how do you, how do you weigh the, the, that, that loss of life versus the loss of privacy versus the loss of, of, of your personal rights? Can I start off on the answer to that and say that that has to be a national debate, a national dialogue. And one of the problems is when the government tries to hide those things. And so when I was alluding to the conflict that a government lawyer has, I should also mention that non-lawyers have played a very important role when these ethical issues have come to them. Um, we would not have known about Abu Ghraib if Sergeant Joe Darby had not blown the whistle. We would not know that there were CIA black sites out there where people were secretly being kidnapped and tortured and interrogated if it wasn't for Mary McCarthy from the CIA who blew the whistle. The NSA wiretapping program that you just mentioned, Russell Tice of the NSA blew the whistle. And we had Ambassador Richard Wilson here in the spring who blew the whistle on the administration's assertion that Saddam Hussein had been receiving uranium from Niger and therefore was 20 hours away from having the nuclear bomb. These people, in my opinion, have done the ethically correct thing because they are allowing the country to debate this issue. And then that needs to be a national debate. But I personally believe that our country is founded on the idea that we have personal freedoms. And if we give away all of our personal freedoms in order to save the country under the theory that it needs to be saved by that, there's not much worth saving. Before you respond, if I could just very quickly make a response. There is a national debate. 
Unfortunately, because of the way our government is set up, the president has, in my opinion, abused his discretion in making some of the decisions. And part of the problem is the people who have been giving him advice and counsel. And we're talking about government lawyers, the attorney generals, and I, I will go down the line and point out situations where I believe each of them have given him bad advice, or they may have given him good advice, and he said, the hell with you, and went ahead and did what he wanted to do because that's what he has done. But there is a national debate, and there are those of us in the House of Representatives and the Senate say, in the name of terror, I'm not giving up my rights. And we should not be giving up our rights. And the dilemma that we have is there's not the groundswell. We need the people in the nation to stand up and say, hey, George Bush, come on, cut this out. Because it, we're debating it and people are thinking, oh, yeah, that's just another partisan debate about whatever the heck it is going on in the Congress. But those, there are those of us who sincerely believe that our rights and there's a constitution. Now, you know, you don't need anything else. We have a constitution and a bill of rights, and we ought to be playing by those rules. Thank you. Yes. Yes. My name is Russ Warren, and I would like to uh, uh, mention that the, the standard that I have heard for personal conduct of ethical behavior, a benchmark for personal conduct, is, is the one that uh, Gary uh, Winnick has referred to, which is shining the bright light, and, and uh, several of the other panelists as well, uh, shining the bright light of public uh, awareness onto a situation. Um, the way it was phrased in the old days was if you wouldn't want to see the f story accurately reported in the, uh, on the front page of the newspaper, don't do it. Today, of course, with the internet, you could update that, but the idea is the same. And I would like to panel's comment as to whether and what what might shortcomings be in that uh, benchmark or uh, is it useful to you or do you have other benchmarks for personal conduct uh, where I mean it's it really ethical behavior problems in many cases stem from the fact that it's gray it's not clear what uh, the um, obvious answer should be Gary do you want to try a uh, sure. Thanks, Russ, for the, uh, for the question. Uh, certainly, the uh, shining light on the situation is a, is a deterrent, but um, in terms of, th that's an external driver, but uh, on top of this, there has to be an internal one where you can sleep at night, I suppose, or, or use your own uh, phraseology, but, uh, uh, you know, ethical uh, dilemmas, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, are, are tests of uh, one's integrity, and uh, those are, those are, should be dealt with uh, um, on an individu individual basis uh, and, and uh, dealt with, uh, quote, correctly. And the, the correctness shouldn't be a matter, and I didn't mean to emphasize too much, a matter of, of whether the light will be cast on one. E even if, uh, if no one knows, it's still a, a matter of your, your personal uh, uh, integrity and, uh, and well-being, I would add. Uh, one thing about ethical leadership, which I'll also add, is it's not a matter of title. It's not uh, the role of a president or a CEO or a, a dean or a vice president. Or it's it's uh, for everyone, and I think that's a tremendous opportunity for the Inamori Center because if it truly is for everyone, absent title, it's something that we can uh, weave in and encourage uh, our students uh, on a daily basis, whether it's whether to collaborate on a homework assignment or uh, 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 make, a, uh, make a financial deal with a partner that uh, you, you want to wriggle your way out of uh, because you didn't, you didn't think about that carefully. Uh, no matter what the situation is, uh, it, it's generally applicable, and I think, I think we do have a, a great opportunity with the center to, uh, to Thank you for together. that, uh, Andre. I mean, that's another point I keep emphasizing, and that is everyone has the opportunity for ethical leadership. And of course, in a university environment, that is even uh, I don't know if something can be truer than something else, but that certainly applies here. Can I add a thought to that? Oh, certainly. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I like that, Russell, that you're focusing on this idea of shining light on the situation, and if it's front page news, 
then people are going to have this external deterrent. They'll think about it. They'll have a cost-benefit analysis before they, they commit these unethical acts. The problem is all those whistleblowers that I mentioned to you, they are the few and far between. Ordinary people don't have the courage to do that. And what happened to each of those people is that they were fired, they were denied promotions, they, were, they suffered other forms of retaliation, their lives were made miserable, they were not rewarded. There is, in fact, government legislation that is supposed to protect and facilitate whistleblowing to accomplish what you're suggesting. And this is maybe a challenge to the Congresswoman and her committee today, <laughs> because um, the, the legislation's not working. First of all, it, it does not apply to going to the press at all, so none of these people would have been covered. Um, those that try to go through the legislation, a recent poll indicated that 37% of them report that they're still threatened or experience reprisals. And then the Supreme Court didn't help out last year when they decided in Garcetti versus Sabellos that government people are not protected by the First Amendment. So you can't claim that there's a First Amendment right to get the information out to the public. This is something that cries out for a legislative response. It's a great idea, but the system is not facilitating it, and it should. Oh, you just given me an assignment. <laughs> <laughs> so I have this great lawyer in the audience, my district director, Betty Pinckney, back there, lawyer. Uh, would you please get with Mike, and let's see what we can do about that <laughs> I noticed you've been taking notes. That's good. Uh, we have a question up here. Ed. Earmarking has become Ed, a major... what's your name? Ed Eigner. Thank you. Earmarking has been a major problem and probably never more, I hate to say this to my excellent representative, but in this particular session. Is there ever a time when it's ethical, for instance, to pass a law Votes may be needed. Is it ethical to go along? Or is there a point where we are able to say, earmarking is not good and there's a better way to do it? <laughs> you know what, there may be a better way, but I don't know what it is. And I know that the people of the 11th Congressional District want me to get earmarks. They sent me there for that purpose. And if I come home with absolutely nothing, then I'm gonna be judged as having not done my job. But keep in mind, I don't engage in conduct to get an earmark. Uh, there's no quid pro quo in my conduct. And that's the dilemma that has brought earmarks to the attention of the public. Uh, it, uh, that's not to say that dollars should not come back proportionately to all the people of America for opportunities. Uh, but it is just like changing how we deliver health care in America is going to be a slow process. Changing earmarking is going to be a slower process. Uh, we've put in place all of these, well, you have to, for every request that I make for dollars, I have to specifically say that I have no financial interest in the request. I mean, if I said I do, that's an ethical violation right there. I mean, it, it, again, I think it's partly common sense, but I think earmarking's gonna be around for a while. And while I got the microphone, let me just also mention this. Currently, I'm trying to, no, I'm not trying. I am educating 10,000 employees of the House of Representatives on ethics. Prior to that, we would have booklets that the members would have, and probably a member would have a staffer who was responsible for ethical conduct uh, within the office. But now we're required to uh, train all 10,000 employees. And uh, I get this all the time on the floor of the House. A member will come over and say, well, Congresswoman, so forth and so on. I said, write me a letter. Because you're never going to be on television standing up saying that the chair of the Ethics Committee told me I could do it, and that's why I did it. <laughs> it ain't going to happen under my watch. Uh, so. Um, it is, but it is challenging to get people to focus in on ethical issues. And even though each of us have an individual opportunity to be ethical, the leader of the organization sets the standard. What's acceptable? What are you looking for from an employee? So if you're in leadership, you got to put it out there. Got to set the policy. Otherwise, the people down around the bottom or the imp that are implementing aren't going to do it. 
add something very quickly Please. to that. I agree with you that the, that the person who is the leader sets the standards, and it's not just setting a, a policy, but it's holding people accountable. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, which side are we? I lost track. Okay, thank you. Arthur. Arthur Hoyer. I'm sorry to go after the congresswoman, but uh, <laughs> um, there's a perception that the <laughs> There's a perception, perhaps unearned and certainly present company accepted, that the Congress is ethically challenged. And uh, in particular, this ethical challenge seems to conflict with partisanship, which certainly in my adult life seems to be getting more and more of an issue. Do you see any hope <coughs> that uh, ethical uh, issues will trump partisanship as we go forward? Before I went to Congress, I had not been in a, a job where partisanship played such a dynamic role. I've been on the Ethics Committee for six years. This is my seventh year as and at first year as chair. It is the only committee that is five, have five Republicans and five Democrats. And without the sixth vote, nothing happens. The dilemma with being with the ethics committee is that the way it is set up is set up for purposes of confidentiality until you reach the point where there is some information that will require uh, the formation of a, a, a investigative subcommittee or there are decisions that are made by the chair and the ranking member that don't even reach the other members of the committee, and it's done outside the light of day. The dilemma for some is that they're not willing to sit in that role and make decisions and be able not to talk to the press, be in, be in fear of the press writing you up because you're not talking. And for me, it's challenging, but it, it's, it's a job that I, I'm managing and I like it. Whether, but see, I don't think that partisanship, ethics is controlled by partisanship. You can be an uh, unethical Republican and you can be an unethical Democrat, you can be an unethical independent. What, what you're seeing is unethical Democrats and Republicans conduct that's coming to the light of day. And the dilemma is there are 10 of them and there are 425 of us that are engaging in ethical conduct, but the 10 you're paying attention to. Uh, the part, we can be partisan and be ethical. Democrats and Republicans are different. There are issues that I'm going to fight for as a Democrat that my Republican colleagues would never even see as important, so that creates the need for me to be partisan. It's a partisan body. It was created that way. Uh, people are talking that they don't want to see us uh, argue uh, in a partisan manner. They want us to get along and do some work. <laughs> and it's who's in the majority, and do you have the ability to move some issues along? Lou Stokes tells me that 30 years ago, they didn't act like they act now that gentle men and gentle women got along and did their work. I'm, uh, I'm, waiting. I'm trying to find a few more gentle men and gentle women <laughs> to work with uh, in the Congress, but I, I don't think they're connected. On this side, uh, yes. Hi, Lev Gonick. Oh, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask a two-part question, and it actually uh, starts with um, an a note that the Inamori Center is actually an international center, and the title of our panel deals with the complex world. Uh, and so I want to frame my question in two parts related to ethics. The first is kind of a strictly, as it were, academic one, which is, is in fact there a universal um, ethical standard? And the reason I raise it is in the context of talking about the education requirements of helping our students understand their role in a hyper-connected, uh, flat world 
in which they will be participating as both global citizens, business people, leaders, and asking whether or not the practices that they find themselves being um, instructed with um, our value systems uh, necessarily and appropriately uh, and without conflict can be connected to the realities that they'll face in a very, very different world than the world that most of us in this room grew up in. Um, and I'm, it's perhaps to Patricia and to Michael to start with because of their experience in the comparative context here. So again, is there a universal standard for ethical practice? And secondly, related to it, as our world becomes flatter all the time and we have to interact on health and business and other relations, um, rather than seeing our ethical practice as the center point or the starting point, understanding that there may well be a need to understand others as well as if not better than ourselves. I take as my starting point, um, I begin with uh, an appreciation for the ways in which our beliefs about ethical behavior are absolutely contested globally so that, um, so that I think that it's very difficult, <clears throat> excuse me, to imagine um, a group of individuals where there is complete agreement about what would be the appropriate thing to do in just about any situation. So even here in this, in, in this auditorium right now, there are many different beliefs and values represented. So I begin from a place where I, um, I imagine conflict and, uh, and, uh, and contention. I do think that there are some things that we can agree about universally. Um, so that you might say, it's wrong to kill someone. Genocide is wrong. But then immediately you're in a position um, where you have to define, uh, you have to contextualize that so, uh, so that horrendous acts are committed everywhere, um, every day. And, and we're faced with the issue of how do we resolve it. The work that you're doing, Michael, is significant um, to push forward uh, uh, um, some kind of uh, resolution of these huge differences that we have about what's right and what's wrong. This is why I think that dialogue and debate is absolutely essential when you, um, when you imagine what it means to be an ethical leader. And let me add to that. In <coughs> the field of international law, there is an analogy that might be drawn between your question in ethics and human rights law, and in particular with some concept known as cultural relativism, which is a concept that says that different countries with their different histories and their different social structures and their different cultural norms should have different human rights that apply to them and that there should not be a universal human rights. And I suppose the analogy would say that law students and business students and med students and engineers should have different ethical norms because they have different contexts. But in fact, in the international law sphere, they have gotten away from this idea of cultural relativism, and there is now recognition that there are universal human rights, that there's a floor that you can't go under. And I think to carry the analogy to the university, the first thing is to get people to think about the ethical question. If you're not thinking about the ethics, you're never going to make the right ethical decision. Secondly, to teach them different approaches. If there isn't a correct decision, a one size fits all, at least there are approaches that can get people to evaluate and get to a better situation. And thirdly, I do think there are some ethical floors. There are some universals out there. And through this process, the students could recognize that and all of us could. Who has the microphone? Good. Please. Good afternoon. My name is Faye Gary, and I am a professor in the School of Nursing, and Dean May Weichel uh, is my dean, and I'd just like to say I think she is an excellent symbol of um, ethical leadership.
I'm, I'm reminded, uh, sir, with your comments. Uh, Jimmy Carter has written a, a book. When you talk about basic um, um, ethical leadership, he makes the case that uh, in order to have world peace, we must focus our ethical attention on housing, health care, education, jobs, and development. Now, I think that's a good way to talk about international ethics and also local ethics as well. I'd like to ask the panel if you would address ethics, individual, organizational, governmental responsibility from the perspective of the alleviation of poverty and human suffering through education and health care. Thank you. As the panel are deciding who's going to answer that. <laughs> Maybe, Patty, you, you, you take these universal things. I, anyway, as you are thinking about that, let me just remind us that the common reading for our incoming freshmen this year, in other words, last week, was called The Working Poor by David Shipler. And presumably, every fresh person <laughs> on this campus, all 1,154 of them, had a dialogue with someone like me last week about poverty and what it means to be poor. Any, any comments, sir? Uh, I was making a note when the other conversations were going on about ethics and international. I can't tell you how many different groups come by the ethics committee from all over the world. The other day I had people from Senegal and from Mongolia in the same room with three different interpreters talking about ethics, you know but they wanted to know what we did and how we handled our committee. Uh, but what I was thinking about was China and the whole issue of doing business with China and the impact that it's had on the business of the United States. The thought was that let's go to China. They have billions of people. We'll be able to sell them product. Then we thought about that the Chinese people don't make enough money to purchase some of our product. And then we started using the Chinese people to build our products. And now we're faced with China valuation of dollars causing a dilemma for us as a nation, but also the whole issue of the products coming from China coming back into the United States and whether or not they meet the standard. And then you add to that the whole issue of labor standards, the issue that we're fighting with now in trade agreements of what are gonna be the labor standards, I think are all ethical issues that kind of flow around what you're talking about. What's the answer? <laughs> Going back to the drawing table, making some enforcement, not trying to, I, some of it I think comes from wanting to get the cheapest product at the cheapest price and not worrying about the outcome and we're catching hell about it. But I do believe that leaders both in public and private and educational institutions have an ethical responsibility with regard to housing, education, jobs, and health care because that is all part and parcel of what allows our communities to be successful. And I sincerely believe that in this new president, Barbara Snyder, we're gonna have an opportunity in Northeast Ohio to make a difference about that because we are suffering in Northeast Ohio with what are we gonna to do to stay on the map and not be just viewed as poor? What are we gonna to do to educate our children so that they can be successful? What are we gonna be able to do to reduce the violence that's happening in our communities? And what are we gonna be able to do to bring people back to the table? Because the other problem I see is people are now, eh, you know, I can't make a difference. I ain't gonna do nothing. I said, come to a meeting. Oh, no, I don't have time for it. And we're gonna have to figure out how we under leadership ethically know that we have an obligation to take care of our community. So I think it's, it's timely. So another panelist who might want to address this question? Yeah, I'd like to make a brief comment. Um, first of all, I think that this issue of uh, people being disconnected from decision-making processes, political processes, is a crisis that we face here um, it, actually, we face, we face it here in Cleveland, we face it nationally. Um, 
and that's a if, for me that's a that's uh, that's something that we could have an entire <laughs> is that right um, in response to your question um, I I find it um, very disconcerting to uh, experience the, the the great health disparities that exist, uh, not just between the north and south. Um, you don't need, I don't need to go to Ibadan or to a small community in Kenya or someplace else in order to experience the impact of poverty. Um, and the impact of, of structural issues on uh, the experience of health and illness. I think that it's absolutely essential for there to be um, partnerships between public and private sectors, locally, nationally, and internationally, um, in order to begin to very systematically uh, uh, work towards ameliorating some of the, the great health divides that exist. Um, in the area of uh, scientific research, investigators are um, experiencing more pressure to uh, provide resources for individuals who are involved in, in their um, investigations or for the communities they represent. But I don't think that it's, um, it's, it's we can't just put that uh, on the shoulders of researchers. I don't think that that's realistic. Um, it's not going to happen. Uh, there is only so so much that a researcher can do, but a, but re investigators in all fields can work and are working now in uh, some areas very effectively with private industry, with um, uh, with uh, public organizations um, to really begin to make some uh, progress. Paul Farmer's work, for example, with Partners in Health is a good example of what can happen when, um, when you act strategically and when you work together crossing, uh, crossing some of those bridges between public and private. One last question, I hope. Who is a lucky person? Community, could, could you identify yourself? Every, eth really every ethical community has a privilege, yea, even an obligation, to express thanks and praise where such is due. And I ask this audience to join me in expressing such thanks and praise to Douglas Eastwood for his heroic work as interim president of this university. Thank you. Thank you. Final question. I'm glad that the uh, dialogue did a shift somewhat from the uh, codes of moral conduct to the, mo the ethical question with regard to the human condition, the greatest social condition. And I'm going to take advantage of the fact that we do have government and law uh, heavily represented. Um, we are, as a nation, um, a great notion founded on noble principles, many noble principles, one of which uh, most treasured is the pursuit of happiness life, liberty, and justice for all. And yet, as a nation, we have become one of the world's, lar well, not one of, the world's largest um, jailer. And we are a nation that consists of double judicial standards, and um, which is consequent, has, has, um, has, has, has that, which the consequence is that we have become this great jailer. Um, a jailer, uh, an industry, the, the fastest growth industry in the United States is the prison industry. It is aligned itself, it's privatizing, and I think there's conflict there and that it is unethical. It's privatizing and align, aligning itself with other industry, creating a very cheap labor force. When I think about labor going to China, that was one of the other issues that we face as a nation in dealing with, with trade, is that we begin to take opportunities away from this country. And now we are in a country where we are the largest jailer, 
uh, we are privatizing that industry. We are aligning itself with, with labor in other industry to create a very cheap labor force. And we have, as because we are a nation with a constitution that does hold the right to free labor, uh, the only clause for free labor is attached to the penal system. Um, we, we are really, I think, um, on the verge of really being, our whole way of life <laughs> is being threatened because of this as a free nation, as a free, the land of the free, you know, having a constitution that undergirds free labor in a country where the, the financial benefits of that industry, I think, um, overrule ethical decisions. So my question would be this, with that interest, where with Dr. Marshall's uh, identity, I mean, identifications or, or definitions of, of ethical leadership, some of them being, let me have to put on my glasses because I can't see, um, responsibility, integrity, accountability, and where trust is foundational. Where is the ethical leadership and the question, not only with regard to this industry that is privatizing itself, that is um, growing and a nation where the standards, judicial standards are dual and a constitution in the land of the free that still has a clause for slavery. I don't know if that okay. is within your that. purview, Patty, or not. Uh, jails and uh, bioethics. Uh, <laughs> let me put this in a very large perspective, and that is not only is the United States one of the largest jailers of any country, um, and it has these, these double standards. But there are a lot of things now that the United States used to stand for and it used to be proud of and the world used to respect, which we no longer do. And the next administration, Republican or Democrat, and the, and the group of people who are in Congress now, um, they have a huge, huge challenge ahead of them to right that ship of state. One of the examples that's directly relevant to your question is, at the same time we're jailing people, mostly African American and mostly for drug offenses, we are allowing Afghanistan to once again increase its opium production off the charts as a way to buy security for our NATO troops. And it's those kinds of double standard deals that we do around the world that come back to bite us and also diminish our standing worldwide. I want to thank you primarily for coming and joining us and for contributing. I apologize to those of you who had questions and had your hands up and we weren't able to get to you. I want to thank, and maybe you can join me in thanking our distinguished panelists <laughs> too. And I invite you all to uh, become involved in this issue of developing ethical leaders. Everyone here can be such. And if you have questions or comments that you'd like to transmit to me personally, my email is my name, gregory.eastwood, gregory.eastwood at case.edu. So uh, please uh, communicate. Uh, the final thing is that um, since you've already figured out what you were doing between one o'clock and 2.30, you might wanna know what to do between 2.30 and whenever you go upstairs. And the answer is that there will be walking tours of the campus conducted by our own students. And they depart from the Smith Library, which is just that way, a few feet. Uh, and the best way of getting there is to go out into the lobby here. There are apparently signs that will direct you around there. So thank you and we'll see you upstairs in uh, about an hour and a half.